Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mikko, and I hunt hackers. I hunt hackers for a living. And I've been doing it for the most of my life. This is my 26th year in analyzing malware, hunting hackers, and trying to stop attacks from happening. I've spent my whole life trying to defend our online security and our online privacy. And I think I've learned a few lessons during those years. I'd like to think I've learned a few lessons during those years. Lessons like complexity is the enemy of security. Or we have to understand who we are fighting in order to have any kind of hope for defending ourselves. But in the end, when we look at all the problems we have, we can actually really distill them to just two main problems. We really only have two types of problems. And those problems are technical problems and people problems. That's it. If we can fix those, then we have nothing left to do. Unfortunately, we will never fix them. Technical problems at least are fixable. Why do we have vulnerabilities in our systems? Well, we have vulnerabilities because these systems have bugs. And bugs are simply programming errors. So the programmers who were writing the system made a mistake. Why do programmers make mistakes? Well, because they're human and humans always make mistakes. But the good news is we know how to fix this. If vulnerabilities are simply programming errors, all we have to do is to fix the bugs. Fix the bugs and make sure everybody updates to the fixed version. And this is why updating and patching is so important. So in theory, technical problems are easy to solve. But then we have the people problems. People problems. People doing stupid stuff. And people will always be doing stupid stuff. No matter how many times we tell them, they will always click on every link. They will always double click on every attachment. They will always give their password to any field that asks for it. And we cannot patch people. There is no patch that we could install in our brains. The closest thing we have to patching people is to educate people. And let me tell you a secret. Education never works. People will never learn. This is the thing that I've learned during the, I don't know, 26 years that I've been trying to educate people. We can tell them as many times as we want. And they will always still double click on every attachment. They will still follow every link. And they will always lose their passwords. And it's a little bit disheartening that it is 2017 and we are still speaking about passwords. Passwords which are ancient security technology. Passwords are like 50 years old as an idea and we are still using them. In 2017 we are still using them. And every single advice you will read about passwords from any newspaper is wrong. All the password advice you ever see is wrong. Because every time you see password advice articles in newspapers, they always tell you the same things. They always tell you that remember to use a long and random password. Make sure it's something that anybody could ever guess. And make sure you have a long, random and unique password on every site. That it's different on every site. And never write them down. Like, what the hell? Like, how, how could you ever do that? I mean, this password advice might have worked in 1970s, when you had like three different servers you needed a password on. But today, every single one of us has more than 100 passwords. My password manager has 400 passwords. Of course I couldn't remember them. Of course, the only way for me to remember them would be that they are easily 
remember, uh, memorizable, which means they're easily guessable, or I would use the same password on every site, or I would write them down. So I choose to write them down, but I don't write them down on a post-it. I write them down in a password manager, which keeps them encrypted. And we had a very good lesson about password security last summer when the LinkedIn breach became public. And I'm guessing that this breach affected most of us. I think most of us in the room were victims of this breach because there was 120 million victims of this breach. And I was one of them. My password was one of the passwords in this breach. So I'm one of the victims. Of course, I had a unique and strong password on the site, so I only really had to change my password on LinkedIn. But as you know, many, many people have the same password everywhere. And when it's stolen from one site, they have to change it everywhere. In fact, according to our um, uh, questionnaires we've been asking from people, around 15% of people say that they only have one password. And I don't mean that they use one password, password manager. I'm meaning they really have only one password. They use the same password everywhere from LinkedIn to their corporate VPN to their online banking, one password. And that's a bad idea. So I was one of the victims of the LinkedIn breach, which means the next question is, who did this? Who hacked LinkedIn? Well, he hacked LinkedIn, this guy. His name is Yevgeny Nikulin. He's from Moscow. He's 29 years old. Um, he hasn't been convicted on this yet, but he has been arrested for this breach and a couple of other breaches. And when Yevgeny hacked LinkedIn, what he was doing with the database was that he was selling it to other hackers and making money that way. And he did it for four years because this hack happened in 2012 and it only became public last summer. And when it became public, we saw all the passwords and we saw all the victims. I was one of the victims. He was one of the victims. Mark Zuckerberg, his email address is in this bridge, which means we now know what was Mark Zuckerberg's LinkedIn password. And his password was da da da. <laughs> And he used the same password everywhere. And obviously he's a smart, I mean, we all know he's a smart guy, right? He's a genius, right? Yet he was using the same password everywhere, almost everywhere. He didn't have the same password on Facebook. He had something else on Facebook. Maybe da, 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 da. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't tried. Don't try. It's illegal. But it's a good example. I mean, even smart people make these mistakes. So, if Yevgeny was selling this database to other hackers, how were they making money with this? How do you make money with LinkedIn passwords? Well, one thing we know they were doing was that they were taking this dump and searching it for webmail passwords, like Gmail passwords. I mean, Gmail accounts. They, they have the email addresses of the victims, so they were searching for Gmail accounts, and then they would try the same password to log in to Gmail. Now, 120 million victims. Let's estimate that, I don't know, 10% of those had a Gmail email address. So that's 12 million Gmail accounts. Let's estimate that, I don't know, 10% of those had the same password on LinkedIn and Gmail. So that would gain access to 1 to 2 million Gmail accounts. All right, how do you convert that into money? Well, what they do is that they search your Gmail history for old emails, because Gmail never deletes emails. So if you have a, an email from eight years ago, it's still there and they can still find it. And they're searching for particular type of emails. They're searching for those emails that you receive when you create an account in an online store. You know these emails. You get an email from the store when you register that, you know, welcome to our store, you now have an account. So they're searching for those, because then they know that this Gmail address has an account in that store. And then, of course, they go and try 
to log in there with the same password. And for many users, the same password will work. But even if the password doesn't work, it doesn't matter. They can still get in. Even if you have a different password for online stores than you have for your Gmail, they can still get in. Because every online store login page has a magic button. There's a magic button on every login page. And that magic button says, I have forgotten my password. So when you go to a login page of an online store and you put in a Gmail account and then you click the button, they will send you a new password to Gmail and they already had your Gmail. So these webmail systems have become a single sign-on system. If you break that, you get in everywhere. And then once they're in your online store account, now they can start ordering stuff like iPads and laptops and you will pay for them and they will order them as gift shipments so they're shipped somewhere else. They're not shipped to you, of course. So how much money did Yevgeny make by selling this database? How profitable is this? Well, I don't know. I don't know how much money he made. But while researching this case, I did find Yevgeny's social media accounts, including videos from YouTube and his Instagram. And when we look, for example, YouTube videos, we'll see Yevgeny speaking about his hobby. And his hobby is sports cars. So he has a Lamborghini Huracan and an Audi R8. This is shot in Moscow. And according to his Instagram, according to his Lambo and his R8, he also has a Mercedes-Benz, an Aston Martin, a Porsche and a Rolex and a goddamn Rolls-Royce. So what was the question? How much money did he make? I don't know, but he made enough. Now, of course, he's not enjoying his Rolls-Royce anymore because right now he's under arrest. But this is the kind of... These are the kinds of cases that we investigate when we look at online crime. And one interesting thing which has happened in our researches regarding online crime is that it's actually easier for us to see how much money they're making. And this is because of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is best known for the ransomware attacks that we see all the time. This is the CTP locker ransom trojan, which locks your system, encrypts your files and asks you for one and a half bitcoins, which is a little over a thousand euros now. But not all of the ransom attacks which are asking ransom in Bitcoin are ransom trojans like this. In fact, the biggest growth right now is not in ransom trojans, it's actually in targeted hackings of online databases, especially MongoDB. And MongoDB is a very popular open database which is typically used to run the back end for a web service. And now there are hackers out there which are scanning the whole internet to find exposed MongoDB databases. Those where they are using default passwords or no password. Then they log into the database and delete them. Well, they take a copy and then they delete the database and they leave one entry in the database which is a message to the admins. And the amount of money they're asking here varies greatly. It varies based on the victim. But since they're asking it in Bitcoin, and they're actually giving the victim a Bitcoin wallet address where to send the money, well, Bitcoin is based on blockchain, and blockchain is a public ledger of transactions, which means it's public, which means we can go and see how many victims have paid the ransom. The, there's actually three different gangs targeting Mon MongoDBs right now um, and they have different wallets. But this is the, the most active wallet I could find. It had 111 transactions, most of which are money being sent to the criminals. So at least 100 victims here have paid. And the amount of hacked databases that we know of is close to 40,000. 40,000 hacked databases which have been encrypted or deleted and which are used to extract money from the companies. Another interesting development with ransom attacks is this new ransom trojan we found last month which is called Popcorn. It targets 
corporate laptops encrypt them, encrypt the network they are connected to. So if it's in your organization, one user can encrypt gigabytes of data in your network. And then it asks for ransom. It asks for two bitcoins, which is quite a lot of money. Now, some of the victims are companies. They have, you know, the money to pay this. But some of the victims are home users. And if the ransom is around 1500 euros, many people don't have 1500 euros to pay. So they offer you an alternative option of getting your files back. If you don't have the money, they will decrypt your files for free. They will decrypt your files for free if you infect two other people. And this is brilliant. It's hard to be angry at these guys when they are so creative. Like, think about this. This is like a pyramid scam combined with the ransom trojan or a chain letter combined with the ransom trojan. You have to infect two other people and they have to pay the ransom. But if they do that, then you will get your files back for free. And this actually works. They will decrypt your files for free if you infect two other persons. So you can sort of see how this spreads. Like you have the victim, he will infect two people. They don't have the money to pay, so they will infect two people. And they don't have the money to pay, so they will infect two people. And we end up with exponential growth. Brilliant idea. So, what's happening in the world of IoT now? Well, one thing we are expecting is that ransom trojans will enter the world of IoT as well. So your IoT washing machine won't wash clothes because it's infected by a ransom trojan and you have to pay a bitcoin to make it work. We haven't actually seen this yet, but it's quite obvious that something like this could happen. Or your smart car won't start until you pay money. In fact, we have already seen ransom trojans on smart televisions. Smart televisions. I've actually coined a law on the term smart. So whenever someone is describing an appliance to you as smart, what you should hear is exploitable, all right? So a smartphone means a, an exploitable phone. A smart watch means an exploitable watch. A smart washing machine is an exploitable washing machine. Smart city, well, you get the idea. <laughs> and this IoT revolution will happen. It's happening right now. There's nothing we can do to prevent it. It's going to happen. And the way we can think about it is that anything that we use to plug in to the electricity grid, anything that we plugged into the wall, will be plugged into the internet as well. In fact, some devices which we even didn't plug into the wall are becoming smart. I'll show you an example. Here is a smart mattress. Yes, a smart mattress that you sleep on. A mattress which is connected to the internet and it has built-in sensors. Like, like, why would you actually build a smart mattress? Well, the idea is that, you know, it's, these sensors will detect when your bed is being used, when you're out of the house, in a suspicious way. And then you will get a warning to your phone. So it, it will tell you that there's something happening on your bed. And this is real. I mean, I'm not shitting you. This actually exists. This is a real product. Made in Spain, by the way. Of course, made in Spain. It looks like a joke, but it's real. And this IoT revolution really started from ICS, industrial control systems, because factories went online already a decade ago. And now it's coming to our homes. So we can learn quite a bit about the problems we will be seeing with IoT by looking at the problems we have seen in ICS. One problem we see in factories and plants is that they are very often secured by keeping them disconnected from public networks. So they build computer-based systems 
everything is being controlled by computers and software, but they don't really have to secure them because nobody can hack them because they're offline or they're not on the internet. And this idea actually works to a, to a limit. It somewhat works. The problem is that it's surprisingly hard to keep things offline. The control interface that you set up originally, which has no password and which is not on the internet, might end up on the internet years later when someone reconfigures your network or connects two networks to each other or adds a bridge or a router somewhere or builds a remote access point or something. We know this because we regularly find this. This is a factory control interface directly on the internet with no username and no password. And obviously nobody planned it like this. Nobody you know, wakes up in the morning and says that, hello, I'm going to today take our steel mill interface and put it online with no password. Nobody does that on purpose. But they do happen by accident. And we keep finding them. So the end result is that we will find like a steel mill with 24,000 kilos of steel at temperature of 1200 degrees and this is on the net with no password. Anybody can go and start clicking on the buttons. And this is a bad idea. It's a bad idea to put your factory online with no password. And we even find things like this. Anybody know what's this? This, my friends, is the control interface for a crematorium. And this is online with no username and password. So we keep finding people's homes. This is somebody's house in Germany, online with no username and password, which means you could go and, you know, turn off the lights or turn off the alarm, or click on the camera button and look at their security cameras, including their bedroom. Which is a bad idea. And let me give you a tip. If you set up a security camera, if you set up an online security camera to monitor the state of your plants, <laughs> Put a password on it. <laughs> That's a free tip. Now, if you are interested in things like these, I, I um, recommend you follow a friend of mine on Twitter, Dan Tentler, known as Viss, V-I-S-S on Twitter, regularly scans the net and keeps finding surprising stuff connected to the internet. It's a good account to follow. So what's the problem then? Obviously, if somebody can look at your security cameras, that's a problem. But what, are, are there security problems here? Well, there are security problems here as well. Because many, in many cases, these IoT devices end up being the weakest link in our network. So we regularly find cases where IoT devices are actually the way in. It's the way in through which the attackers gain access to the internal network. They couldn't get in through the firewall. They couldn't get in through the router. They couldn't get in through the Wi-Fi. They got in through the smart light bulb. And this is the problem. And this is not just a problem for attackers who can gain access to our homes. It's also a problem for our offices. Why? Because our employees are carrying IoT appliances to the workplace. So your employees might be carrying an IoT coffee machine to the workplace and then plugging it into the corporate Wi-Fi. And your IT department doesn't even know it's there. And now it is the weakest link in your corporate network. Last year, we found a vulnerability from a IoT water boiler, which was actually leaking the Wi-Fi password for the Wi-Fi it was connected to. So if it's your corporate Wi-Fi, it's going to leak your corporate Wi-Fi password. And then we have cars. Cars and car hacking. And the risks we think about when we think about car hacking are typically the kinds of risks that 
evil hackers will hack our cars and then they will kill us. And that's not going to happen. Hackers are not interested in killing people. It's also illegal to kill people. I checked this. We should be much more worried about attacks where the attackers somehow benefit from the attacks. So what will car hacking look like? Well, here's a recent example. This is security, security camera footage of a car being stolen. You can see the thief coming to the car, somehow opening the car doors without breaking the window and then getting in. And as he's inside the car, he's not starting to hotwire the car. Instead, he takes out a MacBook. And then he connects the MacBook to the ODB channel of the car with a USB cable and he starts hacking away. After two minutes, the alarm, which is now blinking, stops blinking. After two more minutes, he starts the car and drives away. This is what car hacking looks like. Because this makes money. And money is a great motive. Car thieves are, or, and car theft is already a big problem. If they could steal the car without breaking windows or hot, uh, hot wiring the car, of course they would rather do that. Another thing with IoT is that it can be used to build botnets. In October we saw the biggest denial of service attack on the history of the internet. Attack which was launched from the Mirai botnet, originally developed by a hacker known as Anna Senpai. And this attack network consisted of 120,000 uh, devices. And none of those devices were computers. They were all IoT devices like DVR recorders or security cameras or heat pumps, stuff like that. How did Mirai get onto those devices? Was there, some, was there a vulnerability on these devices? No, there wasn't. Mirai simply scans IP ranges and whenever it finds an IoT device, it tries logging in to the IoT device with the default admin username and the default admin password. So it tries things like admin admin or root default or support support or it tries my favorite mother fucker. <laughs> and that's it. I wonder if they actually translated the motherfucker part. <laughs> and this, this was enough. With these passwords it gained access to 120,000 devices. And what's happening here is quite obvious. Remember VHS video players we used to have in our houses? Most of us do. The, the youngest members of the audience might not remember. But we all had a VHS player in our living room, underneath our television. And whenever you went to your friends, you would see their VHS player. And every time you saw it, it was blinking zero. Every video player you've ever seen is blinking zero, zero, zero. Why? Because that's the time. It's supposed to display the current time. But when power goes off, it forgets the time and now it's blinking zero, zero, zero. And nobody knows how to set the time. Or nobody is bothered enough to set the time. We don't care. And this is the problem we're seeing with IoT devices. You buy a new IoT security camera. You bring it home. <coughs> you put it on the wall. You turn it on, you install the app, app on your phone, you try it for the first time, and it works. You get the video stream, excellent. Now don't touch it, don't do anything else, you might break it. That's what people do. Which means they leave the default password on the device. This is the equivalent of the VHS videos blinking zero in 1980s. We don't configure our devices, and it's not mandatory to configure our devices. And by the way, the protocol Mirai is using to try these passwords is not SSH and it's not HTTPS. It's using Telnet. I know, it's, it's very sad 
but our brand new IoT devices, many, many of them are using Telnet for admin connections. Telnet, which we stopped using in our computers in the 1990s, because it was so damn insecure. Telnet doesn't encrypt any of the communication, including it doesn't encrypt your password. So if you're telnetting somewhere over a Wi-Fi, everyone in the same Wi-Fi can grab your password from the, from the air. And it seems that we are repeating the same mistakes with these IoT devices that we already fixed in our computers long time ago. For some reason we are forced to repeat the same problems. We're using Telnet for admin functionality. Uh, these IoT devices are al almost always running Linux and when you look at the kernel version, it's like three versions old kernel and there's no way to update it. And this is another problem we solved in our computers with auto updates. So we're going backwards with security of our IoT devices. And these IoT devices will not get better by themselves. The manufacturers of IoT appliances will not fix these security problems by themselves. Why? Because security is not a selling point for home appliances. When you go to buy a washing machine, you're not asking questions about the intrusion prevention technology or the firewall of the washing machine. The most important selling point for washing machines is price. Price is the most important thing. The second most important thing is like, you know, how much clothes can it wash? The third most important selling point is the color of the appliance. Cybersecurity never even enters the discussion. And this means that the vendors who built these devices cannot afford to invest money into security. Because price is so important, they have to be as cheap as possible. And nobody's asking for security, so why would they invest money there? We're setting ourselves up for failure. And the only way I can see to fix this is, unfortunately, regulation. Because I don't really ro like regulation. But we already regulate safety of our home appliances. Maybe we should regulate the security of our home appliances as well. Because if you buy a washing machine, you can be pretty sure that it's not gonna have a short, uh, short circuit and catch fire. And you can be pretty certain that it's not gonna give you an electric shock. Because we regulate that. But it will leak your Wi-Fi password. Even more importantly, if your washing machine has a short circuit and it catches fire and it burns down your house, the appliance manufacturer is liable for the damage. But when the very same washing machine leaks your Wi-Fi password and every computer in your home is encrypted by a ransom trojan, somehow the vendor is now not liable. And this is what we should change. We should make IoT appliance manufacturers liable not just for the safety problems of their appliances, but also for the security problems of their appliances. Otherwise this problem will not fix itself. Now you could even claim that the Internet of Things is now becoming a clear and present danger for the whole Internet, which is pretty sad. Another big development underway right now is governments. Governments hacking. Governments writing malware. The headlines for the past three months have all been about this pair. And of course, their friend. <laughs> there was a very interesting interview in Bloomberg TV uh, before the elections. During that interview, President Putin was asked the key question. He was asked, Mr. Putin, who hacked the Democrats? And he answers, he answers, is that really important? Does it even matter who hacked it? The important thing is the content of the emails. There is no need to distract the public 
about who did it. There is no need to distract the public about who did it. We shouldn't be looking at who hacked the Democrats. We should look at the leaked emails, which is a very telling comment from Putin. And I am old enough to remember the time when it was hackers who were causing havoc and releasing private information. And now, today, it seems to be governments causing havoc and releasing private information. It sure is strange. But this is the world where we live in. So is this cyber war? No, it's not. No, this is not cyber war. Why? Because Russia and United States are not at war. How could some attack be a part of a war if there is no war? Most of the governmental attacks that we see are about espionage. Almost all of the governmental attacks that we have investigated over the last 15 years have been about stealing information. And espionage is not war either. Espionage is espionage. So are there any attacks that we have seen which we should categorize as cyber war? The answer is yes. Yes, there have been attacks that I think are examples of cyber war attacks. For example, late last year, there were attacks targeting the smartphones of Ukrainian artillerymen. Attacks coming from Russia. And as these soldiers had their phones infected by a piece of Russian malware, that malware was used to geolocate where they were. After which, the Russian soldiers from the Russian side were shooting artillery to those locations, killing these soldiers. And if we don't call that cyber war, I don't really know what we should call cyber war. When soldiers get killed in a war because their phones were hacked, that's cyber war. So we are in the middle of big changes. And one phrase you might have heard is that the data is new oil. And this is absolutely true. Data is new oil. We don't really have to look beyond any other company than Google to see how data is the new oil. Because we all use Google, Google search or watch videos from YouTube or Gmail or Google Docs or Google Maps, and we don't pay a cent. These services are free. Excellent. No money paid. Yet, somehow, mysteriously, Google made 80 billion in revenue last year and 12 billion in profit, even though we didn't pay anything. If that doesn't nicely illustrate how data is the new oil, I don't know what would. And just like oil brought us prosperity and problems, Data will bring us prosperity and problems. Oil brought us problems like global warming or pollution of the nature. If you're working with oil, you have to worry about oil leaks. If you're working with data, you have to worry about data leaks. And I'll illustrate this point about data being the new oil with an interesting application from a company called FindFace. This is an example of a big data application which is able to search for faces from social media. So somebody snaps a picture for you of you while you're walking down the street and then they can find you from Facebook and know who you are, which is a little bit, you know, not really nice. But this technology exists and it's actually better than we think because in this example they actually take an old photo, old photo which has three people and they choose the child. 
This photo is 12 years old, so this child is nowadays an adult, but they are able to find her from social media based on a 12-year-old photo. And this is remarkable, I mean, it's kind of cool. It's really, really cool technology, but it's also very creepy, isn't it? So data is the new oil. And if you're working with data, you have to worry about data leaks. Just like if you were working with oil, you had to worry about oil leaks. And this, my friends, this is the world where we live today. Thank you very much.